Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, we're just still letting some people in from the waiting room, but for those of you who are with us this evening, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm going to start off with just a few house rules, which for those of you who have joined us for our previous webinars, you'll be uh, very familiar, but for those of you who haven't, if you could please just keep your microphones on mute, this um, just ensures that there's there will be no um, there will be no audio uh, interruptions to to the evening's presentation. But of course, as many of you have already, please feel free to um, switch on your videos so that you can get a feel for who's in the meeting and um, and and have a bit more of a, a physical feel to the meeting. Um, so welcome welcome to you all this evening. Um, before I do the introductions, I just want to welcome you on behalf of the Zionist Federation and the WZO, the World Zionist Organization here in the UK. Um, and also just to let you know of a couple of uh, events that are coming up, and I will follow this up with an email tomorrow to you all with full details. Um, we have a, an event uh, next Thursday evening uh, featuring uh, an Anglo-Israeli reservist soldier who served in the IDF spokesperson unit during the recent May uh, Operation Guardian of the Walls, so that's next Thursday. And then the week after, the Thursday after on the 21st, we are hosting the Israeli ambassador Tsipi Hotavelli in a, a physical event in northwest London. Um, I'll send through all the details uh, to you tomorrow, but for obvious security reasons, um, we can't uh, divulge the actual location, but that will, once you register, that will be sent to you two days before the event. So please, please do consider joining us for, for one or more of those events. Um, there is also, on behalf of our esteemed guest speaker, or one of our esteemed guest speakers this evening, to be a book, there is an event um, that he is holding at the Mill Hill Synagogue next week, and it's all about Ilan Ramon, Israel's first um, astronaut, um, and it promises to be a very fascinating event. And as I understand, Tuvia, correct me if I'm wrong, but Tuvia will be there in person at the Mill Hill Show. I will. Yes. Um, and I'll send details of that tomorrow as well. So now that I've got all of that out of the way, and we've got um, more people joining, which is wonderful. Um, just to uh, introduce our, our guest speakers. So we have Yael Brewer. Um, Yael is a, a, a journalist. She's a TV presenter, and she's also an author. She teaches um, modern Hebrew, and she is one of the, she's a co-author of the fantastic book, which I have on my shelf and my children have in, in their book collection as well. It's called Hilarious Hebrew. And um, in tomorrow's email, I will follow up with, with details on how you can, how and where you can get that book. Um, I'd, I'd, for anyone who, who has an interest in Hebrew, I would highly recommend it. Um, and it's something I dip into every now and then. Uh, and as you know, as many of you who have joined us before, you're very familiar, you'll be familiar with uh, Dr. Tuvia Book who is um, a leading Israeli tour guide. He's an author, an educator, and a former soldier in an elite IDF combat unit, and an absolute mensch. So, um, you know, without further ado, we're all here to, this evening to hear from both um, Tuvia and Yael all about Menachem Begin, Israel's sixth um, prime minister. And I won't, I won't attempt to, to say anything really about Menachem Begin. I'll leave that to the, the professionals that we have here this evening with us. So without further ado, Yael, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, good evening, everyone. Right, it's, it, you know, it's not uncommon to, to describe various politicians as, uh, as controversial. Uh, but I do think that Menachem Begin has, has taken that uh, definition, that description uh, a step up. Um, he's always been controversial since very early on, since, uh, well, since he started um, his political involvement at an early, early, uh, early stage. He still is, years after his death, a controversial figure, um, you know, both, both venerated and, and, and reviled in pretty much, I think, equal measures. Um, I mean, in fact, only yesterday I spoke to two people who come to these um, lectures uh, sometimes, 
Uh, one of them was uh, very keen to come today. He said he's fascinated by begging and he, he's here today. And that means that he's uh, had to get up at 6.30 in the morning because he's in New Zealand. So good morning, David. While the other one said that he wasn't going to come because he didn't want to hear about Menachem Begin. It made him too angry. Uh, and that's only, you know, yesterday. So very much still a, a hot topic about Menachem Begin. But I think that whatever you think, whether you, you love him or loathe him, uh, people would always disagree about certain things about Menachem Begin. And uh, th the first one is his incredible, incredible achievements, which Tuvia will obviously talk about. Um, the second one is his very dramatic downfall. Um, the third one, uh, one of uh, third one of, of many others, but the fact that he was an incredible speaker. He was an incredible, he really had the gift of the gab. And when you think about it, Hebrew was not his native language. Uh, he was an incredible orator. So, like with all people, pretty much, yes, everybody, when we learn about the person, what they do, how they did it, why they did it, we need to go to the beginning. And my first question to you, Tuvia, will be exactly that. If you can tell us about Menachem Begin, the very the background of the family, the very early years. And in fact, just for your um, Jewish history pub quiz, the midwife who delivered Begin was in fact the grandmother of another controversial Israeli politician, Ariel Sharon. If you want to look into that as a, anything symbolic, it's, it's up to you. But Tuvia, tell us about the child and, and the young person, Begin the youngster. Hey, good evening, everybody. Nice to see everyone again. Um, so what's fascinating about Begin is you wouldn't have known by the way that he grew up what he would later turn into be on the one hand. On the other hand, we learn in uh, Hebrew, in the Mishnah, Dame Ayin Bata Vlana There's an expression that says, know where you come from in order to know where you're going to. And once we understand exactly Begin's upbringing and who his parents were and the environment he grew up in and what happened to him in his early years, it explains so much about Begin, the underground leader, about Begin, the politician. So his parents, basically, he was born in a place called Brisk. Uh, and uh, Brisk is now in Poland, but it used to change borders every now and then. Uh, and basically his father, his name was Herzl, was a Zionist. His mother was very much um, an old tradition, from an old school traditional rabbinical family. So you grow with a lot of tradition and Zionism together. Uh, so a very activist family growing up. He's very, very close with his siblings, with his parents. And he's also a very smart lad as well. And he basically, at an early age, he uh, got accepted to study law in Warsaw. And like many of the uh, early politicians of Israel, was a polyglot. He spoke English. He spoke Polish. He spoke Yiddish. He spoke German. And he spoke remarkable Hebrew as well. As Yael was telling you about his oracle abilities, we are actually going to hear different excerpts of him speaking tonight with subtitles. But whenever he got up to speak, whether people loved him or hated him in the Knesset, everyone would just stop what they were doing. The cafeteria would empty out, people working the cardinals empty out, begging speaking, everyone would rush in to hear what he said. And the amazing thing is of all Israel's prime ministers, he has had the most documentaries uh, made about him because uh, of his sheer fascination. It's kind of like Begin is Israel's Marmite. You love him or you hate him, but it's very difficult to be impartial to him. Um, so just to show you just how much he's in the news, even now, years after his demise, uh, we're going to start off the presentation tonight with the latest documentary made about Begin, over to Steve. So you can see very much still in people's minds and people's hearts, for all sorts of different reasons. And you'll hear in the documentary, even people who didn't agree with him still admired him. So let's see the clip of the trailer of the latest uh, documentary on Begin that literally just came out a couple of months ago. Over to you, Steve. This whole vision for Israel was for Jews to come here, feel like it's a safe haven. What he want to say is stay straight. Very difficult. 
different from my political views, but I think he was one of the greatest leaders that Israel had. Menachem Begin believed in the need for the Jews to seize their future. Begin was very much a survivor. Never again there won't be another Holocaust in the history of the Jewish people. He was described as being anti-democratic, but he proved to be the most democratic of all. He had faith in his convictions and a very clear view of the way that things are supposed to go. He was a hero for all the Jewish Ethiopian community. No more war. He had the credibility to make the first peace with an Arab nation. He was a man of profound contradictions. Both sides were engaged in an existential fight. Israel has nothing to apologize for. Menachem Begin, with all his faults, belonged to a different class of leader. Rise, struggle, and guarantee the prospect of living in peace for your children and their children. Okay. So you can see that even the even the youngsters today who didn't grow up with Begin, they've all heard about him, they've learned about him, they studied about him. And he was he's just an incredible personality. If anyone's familiar with the book, uh, The Prime Ministers, uh, you'll notice that um, of all the prime ministers who are written about in that book, um, Begin is the one who's really gone as the most amount of attention. Um, and a lot of it is just to do with, with just how many things he managed to achieve in how many different spheres. Uh, but all of it started in his childhood, which again was traditional, but also very, very Zionistic. And in fact, uh, at a very young age, and when he was a teenager, he heard the great Zionist orator, Vladimir Jabotinsky, come and speak in Poland. And he was, he was caught hook, line and sinker. And uh, while still a student in, as law, he later, he became the head of Beitar in Poland, which was the youth movement of Jabotinsky. Yeah, El. So, Tobia, he, so he started, he, he, Jabotinsky was um, very much, um, you know, his, his doctrine was something that he aspired to be involved with. Um, tell us about his, his involvement and the circumstances that, me, that led him to escape from Poland, which is already an act that was or can be seen as controversial in itself. Absolutely. So uh, Begin was the head of the Beitar uh, Zionist movement uh, in pre-war Poland, and they had thousands and thousands of uh, members. Uh, people don't realize that before the Holocaust in Poland, one out of 10 uh, citizens of Poland was Jewish. There was 3 million out of 30 million were, uh, were Jewish. And in some towns like Warsaw, every third person you walk past in the street was Jewish. So Warsaw was a lot more Jewish than New York City is today, for example. Uh, and it was just in a very Jewish country. And uh, one of the Zionist youth movements that called Beitar that Begin headed had tens of thousands of members. And when the World War II started, as we know, with the, with the pact between Germany and the Soviet Union, Poland was divided. Uh, the, the Germans invaded the, uh, the West half and the Russians, the Soviets invaded the Eastern half. And very controversially, Begin got up with his wife and his uh, sister-in-law, and they fled to Soviet-occupied uh, Vilnius and left all the members of Beitar behind in Poland with nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. And this decision of his would color a lot of his later life, later decisions. Very controversial. And ironically, isn't it, uh, that the Soviets actually arrested Begin for being uh, a sort of British collaborator which is ironic when you think about his his uh, relationship with Britain afterwards. Absolutely, yes. And I did. I didn't mention his wife briefly. And I just wanted to bring her up again. Um, Begin and uh, Elisa, they had a very pure, pure love. Uh, I've got this book over here, written by Daniel Gordas, called Menachem Begin: um, The Battle for Israel's Soul. It's a fantastic book, and in it he describes how Begin met his wife, and this is what he wrote. 
Um, Begin only took one break from his frenzied political activities on behalf of Betar for the purpose of marrying Elisa Arnold. He'd met the dark-haired girl in Galicia when he stayed by her family after a speech he delivered in the local Betar chapter. The day after he met her, this is a quick mover over here, the day after he met her, he delivered a note saying, I saw you, my lady, for the first time, but I feel as if I've known you all my life. And really, within weeks, they were already engaged, and she was very much a pillar by his side throughout his entire life. Not only that, when, when she passed away, really, it was the end of Begin's life as well, which we'll get to later as well. But their love was pure, and their love was just absolutely a true fairy tale romance. Okay, so maybe we can now move to the to the next phase in their lives. They, they left Europe... Um, he came to Palestine. He actually came to Palestine as part of the Polish army. Uh, but what happened there? Okay, so as you mentioned, he was arrested by the Soviets in Vilnius, ironically for belonging to a uh, Zionist youth movement, put in a Russian gulag, and he wrote a book about it many years later called White Nights. Um, and then miraculously, the Germans broke their pack, invaded, invaded Soviet-held uh, uh, Poland, and the Soviets let him out as a free Pole, where he joined the General Anders Free Polish Army, and by a very convoluted route, ended up in the British Mandate of Palestine uh, in 1943. And when he got there, he was kind of a, a major celeb, because he'd been the head of Beitar in pre-war Poland, and uh, the underground movement known as the Irgun, the Etzel, uh, were quite, were leaderless at the moment because their leader, David Raziel, had been killed on a mission fighting for the British. And he sort of stepped into that slot and he became the leader of the Irgun Sva'i Lumi or the, or the Etzel or the Irgun or the IZL. And that was really the next stage of his life from 1943 till 1948, the next five years of his life as part of the uh, underground uh, movement. And when he was uh, when he was leading the Irgun, I mean, he he really did something. First of all, he became the most wanted man by the British at some stage. Mm -hmm. uh, right. He had a dead or alive warrant, um, you know, um, by the British. He he did some things that really sound like they were part of 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 some action movie, and 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 the way that he managed to escape um, from from being caught by the British. It, it, I mean, many identities, false identities. Um, you know, he was very controversial already. Maybe you can tell us uh, about a few of the activities that that he uh, that he was the leader of while in the Irgun, and also how he managed to escape from being caught. Okay, well, the thing is, as we all know, the British were there. Winston Churchill was the Prime Minister in World War II, and even though he was very much pro-Zionist, uh, Winston Churchill also kept in play the entire war the infamous white paper allowing um, Jews, so not allowing Jews to come into the land of Israel when they needed it the most. As we all know, in, back in 1917, the British had issued the Balfour Declaration and um, His Majesty's government views with favor, uh, the establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. But by 1939, just before the war, the same British government had issued a white paper almost limiting Jewish immigration to nothing and forbidding land purchase just when the Jews needed a homeland the most. So basically it made the British mandatory government accessories to murder. And uh, the, the, the Yeshuv, or the, the pre-state um, Jews in, the, in Palestine were, had a bit of a quandary because when World War II broke out, they didn't know quite what to do. On the one hand, the British are fighting the Nazis. On the other hand, the British are not allowing Jews to come into Israel. So David Ben-Gurion famously said, we're going to fight the white paper, the British white paper, and try and illegally bring in Jews. If there's no uh, war, but we're going to fight the wars if there's no white paper. And the British basically, and the, sorry, the Jewish undergrounds had a truce against the British. Um, and that was in place when Begin got there in 1943. But in 1944, Begin decided the British are going to win the war anyway, and we need to get Jews in. Uh, and so he restarted the revolt against the British whilst World War II was still raging, which is really quite a controversial decision because the British were using all of their manpower to fight against the Nazis. And Begin had restarted a war against them whilst that war was still raging. And he came to a conclusion when World War II was over, as we all know, very interestingly, the, the British population showed their gratitude to um, 
Winston Churchill by voting him out of office as soon as the war was over. And the Labour government came in and their promise was, we're gonna repeal the white paper. Of course, what happened is they said repeal. No, I don't think you heard us right, Jews. We're gonna reinforce it. So even people who survived the Holocaust are not going to uh, be allowed in to the British mandate. And this caused a crazy thing to happen. It caused Jews to work together. So all the Jewish undergrounds, the Haganah, the Agun, the Etzel, all decided to form United Hebrew Resistance to get the uh, British out. So when Jews work together, we always know that things are quite serious. And whilst we had the United Hebrew Resistance, while Yael was referring to, he carried out one of his most controversial acts as the head of the Agun, and that was the infamous King David Hotel bombing in July 1946. The result of that, as we all know, was 91 casualties, Jews, uh, British and Arabs were all killed when that hotel exploded. And um, it's basically was part of his legacy to such an extent that many years later, uh, when he came to Britain as an official state visitor, as the Prime Minister of Israel, there was large demonstrations against him because he was seen as a terrorist for what he did during the Agun. So the King David Hotel, we have something in, there's something in England called the British, the Secrets Act, the Official Secrets Act. Begging claimed they were warned, the British said they weren't warned. It turned out years later when the papers were released that they were, they were warned, but the British uh, officer in charge of the hotel said, we're here to give orders to the Jews, not take orders from them and refuse to evacuate the hotel. But this was only known decades later. At the time when that hotel exploded, even the other Jewish underground movements were very, very, uh, critical of Menachem Begin. And um, the British, as Yale mentioned, put an award on his head, not just a reward, a hundred thousand pounds. It was a vast amount of money. He was the most wanted man in Palestine. So, and he had a very um, distinctive look as well. So the question is, when you look like Menachem Begin, how do you hide yourself? And just to get an answer, the uh, Israeli uh, National Library put out a one minute clip on all the disguises that Begin used. Let's go and see that one next. Steve, over to you. Steve, are you with us? Yeah, yeah I'm with you. Just uh, there you go. That's there right. Go. Okay, so as you can see, he definitely kept the British guessing with all his disguises from rabbis to university students to, to German immigrants, and they never actually caught him. Um, but I did want to mention, just to add on, uh, something that will come out later, that, that the documentary that we saw at the beginning was called Hamafach, or The Upheaval. And that refers specifically to something that happened in 1977, when Begin finally left the opposition. But in it, he refers to an event that happened when he was head of the Ogun. And this event was um, in the British Mandate prison in Jerusalem. Uh, there were two, uh, an Irgun member and another Jewish underground member who were caught. Uh, one of them was Sephardic and one of them was Ashkenazic. And they were caught in this prison cell for possessing weapons. And the British were going to hang them. And uh, they were called Moshe Barazani and Meir Feinstein were their names. And uh, Begin was their commander, basically. And um, they asked if they could smuggle a grenade into their cell. So they said, you know, when the British come to hang us, then we'll kill the hangman as well, just like Samson pulled down the temple on top of the Philistines. Uh, but then the rabbi who was supposed to uh, told them he was going to come when they were being hanged. And they said, don't come because they were scared they might kill him. But he insisted on coming. So that night, rather than risk killing the rabbi, but not giving the British a pleasure of hanging them, they put the grenade between their hearts sang a song called Adon Olam, and when they finished the last line, God is with me and I will not fear, they pulled the pin and, um, and uh, killed themselves. And Begin was so moved by this act that when he died, he asked buried next to them on the Mount of Olives, and he refers to them in a speech, which you're gonna hear later on. That, uh, that, that event happened when he was in charge of the Agun. Um, and basically he was known uh, to have 
glasses that didn't see color. Uh, there was a lot of division in Israeli society, which you will mention between Ashkenazim and Sephardim, uh, Oriental Jews and European Jews, the first couple of decades of the state of Israel. But Beckham was known even at that early stage, not to look at the color of people's skin or where they came from, but rather uh, their characters. I wonder, um, Tuvia, if you want to mention the uh, two other episodes um, or two other cases, uh, one with the, um, the the British sergeants um, mm. and one with the Altalina ship. Okay, well, the British sergeants is a very, very uh, unusual story and disturbing story. Basically, uh, people thought that because Begin uh, was in charge of the King David Hotel, that the British threw in their hat and decided they had to leave. That wasn't what caused the British to leave. What caused the British to leave Palestine was something else that the Irgun did. There was an unusual uh, choice and morally controversial choice as well, where basically the British captured three Irgun members and they would put them in prison in Akron, so they're going to hang them. So Begin said, I'm sorry, you can't hang our boys. You, they need to be treated as prisoners of war. So he ordered the Agun to go out and catch a high-ranking British to use as collateral, but they couldn't find any. So they were walking around, all the generals and all the judges were in hiding. So all they found, never was these two British sergeants, conscripted soldiers, who happened to be the wrong place at the wrong time, taking a walk on the beach in Netanya. So they kidnapped them and hid them. And the Agun said, if you hang our boys, we're going to hang yours. And the British put the entire country into a uh, curfew, searched everywhere. They couldn't find them because they were already in a pre-prepared place. And then what happened? The British said the Jews wouldn't dare. No one hangs British soldiers. And they called the Jews bluff and they hanged the three Jewish underground members in the Acre prison. And so now they had a dilemma. What do we do? They're already dead anyway. Should we just let the sergeants go or should we hang them? Now, this story is... Um, was taken up years later by the famous writer Elie Wiesel, who wrote the book Night about his Holocaust experiences. He wrote a follow-up book called Dawn, dealing with this particular episode as well and the moral dilemmas. So the question is, do we hang them? Don't we hang them? Do we, do, do we turn ourselves into the monsters who we're trying to replace? And uh, the decision was made eventually to hang the boys. Whenever I'm guiding in Israel, especially with teenage groups or with uh, university age groups, I ask them the question, what would you do? Do you think it's the right thing to hang them, not to hang them? And again, as much as it's difficult to judge people years later, it's a very, very uh, emotional decision to make. On the one hand, if we hang them, are we no worse than our enemies? On the other hand, if we hang them, maybe that'll stop the British hanging our men as well. They didn't know. So they made the decision to hang them. The next question I asked them is, what would you do if you found out that one of those British conscripts was a Jew? Would you let him go and only keep the non-Jew? And it could have happened. My late grandfather was a soldier in the British Eighth Army, uh, uh, North Africa and Italy with Montgomery, and Jews were conscripted by large numbers to the British Army. And one of these guys was a Jew. So what do you do in that circumstance? Do you let him go? Don't you let him go? And the crazy thing, if you want to talk about bravery, and this is an unusual story, which might be the only thing you remember from tonight, is that one of them was Jewish. His name was Clifford Peace, he was from Wales. And he decided not to tell the Agun captors that he was Jewish, because he didn't want them to let him go and to kill his friend. So he didn't say anything. But when the Agun um, hangman, for, better, for lack of a better word, was putting the rope around his neck, he said, Shema Yisrael, the Jewish, the last Jewish prayer that one says before one dies, uh, praising God in Hebrew, but they hanged him anyway. And the hanging of those two sergeants, despite the fact that the British had 100,000 soldiers in Palestine, there was only 600,000 Jews. So for every six Jews, there was a British soldier, but the hanging of those two sergeants broke the British world to stay there anymore. All the British newspapers, after the revulsion of the hanging, the next sentence was bring our boys home. You had women in England who hadn't seen their husbands or their sons or, or brothers for six years of World War II. Then they're sent out to Palestine. Then they start hanging British soldiers. So it was that hanging, as controversial as it was, that finally led the British to throw in the towel and give the whole problem to the United Nations. And Tuvia, just before we move to the next phase, if you like, the, the establishment of the State of Israel mm -hmm. and what happened after that, do you want to talk about the, the, the story about the Altalina, the, the, the ship? Both. Right. So, you know, as much as uh, Begin's a controversial figure outside of Israel, he's just as controversial in Israel as well. Um, in fact, one of Israel's historians, one of the famous historians of Israel, um, called Anita Shapiro, 
she said it was impossible to exaggerate uh, the Begin Ben Gurion animosity. Uh, David Ben Gurion was, as we all know, the first Prime Minister of Israel. And uh, David uh, and Menachem Begin was in the opposition for 29 years. He lost nine elections before he eventually was elected. That's a lot of uh, incredible amount of stamina to stay in the game. But it all started from the pre state when there was two different ideologies in Israel. The Haganah was very much a, affiliated with the socialist. Um, side of Israeli society and the Igun was, was which was a much smaller movement there was about 30,000 members of the Haganah underground movement and only about 3,000 members of the Igun but that was affiliated with revisionist Zionism and to say as Anita Shapiro said that they didn't get on is a British understatement so once uh, the British leave and the, the state of Israel is declared in 1948 uh, there was a ceasefire and during that ceasefire uh, the Irgun decided to bring in an, a ship called the Altelena, full of Holocaust survivors, Irgun members, and also a massive amount of armaments for the nascent idea. However, at that time, when the war started, Jerusalem was theoretically a, a neutral city. It didn't belong to the Jews or the Arabs. According to the United Nations Partition Declaration, it was an internationalized city. So as much as David Ben-Gurion had actually made the IDF, his own defense forces, all the underground movements together into the IDF, uh, in Jerusalem, they still fought alone. So David, uh, so to cut a long story very short, when the ship comes in, and it, it initially lands at a place called uh, Far Vidkin in Netanya, and they start unloading. And the Haganah, um, I should say the IDF come, and, uh, and Begin is there as well. And somehow, no one knows how it started, but shots started being fired. And Begin ordered the ship to weigh anchor and to sail to the seafront in Tel Aviv. So Begin's on the ship. There are thousands and thousands of rounds of ammunition and all sorts of uh, armaments on the ship. Holocaust survivors are good members. The ship is beached right opposite the, the seashore, the hotels, the promenade in Tel Aviv. And on the seafront are members of the Palmach movement, including another later prime minister, Yitzhak Rabin. And a firefight starts between the Ugun and the Haganah, or more accurately between the Haganah and the ship, because Begin ordered his soldiers not to fire back. He said, Jews don't fire upon Jews. And then in a very controversial act, uh, the IDF starts shelling the ship. David Ben-Gurion ordered them to shell the ship. And one of these uh, shells hit the ship, set it to light, it's full of ammunition, and uh, Begin's followers try to drag him off the ship, and he doesn't want to leave. He wants to be the last person on the ship. And this goes back to what Yael asked me earlier about him running, running away when World War II started and going to free Poland, and because he had this like stigma, he wanted to stay on the ship. Eventually they dragged him off. People say it was Ben-Gurion's attempt to actually kill Begin, just in case you think Israeli history is boring. And Ben-Gurion later said, the cannon that fired on the Altalena should be blessed. And uh, if there's ever a third temple, that cannon should be placed in the third temple. There's quite a strong hatred going on over there. And that, that kind of hatred and enmity is what colored Israeli politics for the next three decades. And very interestingly, when Ben Gurion finally gets onto the seashore, he makes a very emotional radio broadcast and he says the famous line in Hebrew, Milchemet Achim Leolam Lo, we will never have a civil war. And he forbade any of his uh, followers from uh, responding or fighting back against the Haganah. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. okay. Crazy stuff. Moving on, the establishment of the State of Israel, 1948. Begin becomes more of a mainstream politician, if you like. But as, mm -hmm. you, as you said earlier, he was in opposition for so many years. I don't want- 29 I don't know years, it, yep. Yes. And, you know, it, it, takes, a, it, it takes a special person to, to, to stay, you know, in that role for, for such a long time. Um, but then eventually in 1977, something happens. I don't know if you want to say anything about the, the time until 1977, or shall we, shall we talk about the Mahapach? Okay, so just one thing I want to say before 1977, and that was something that happened in the early 1950s, also very controversial and very interesting. And that basically is um, the decision whether to accept reparations from Germany in the early 50s. And let's not forget Israel back then had 
about 120,000 Holocaust survivors living in Israel. It's very raw. People walk, I, I even remember as a child walking around Israel and still seeing people numbers on their arms and uh, people speaking secular Yiddish, which is very much a dying language today. Um, and it was very, very much in people's minds, especially Ben Gurion, uh, sorry, especially uh, Begin himself, who lost both his parents and his siblings uh, in the Holocaust. And David Ben Gurion was a very pragmatic man. And he decided that he was going to uh, accept reparations from West Germany. And Begin led demonstrations of tens of thousands of people against this. And he was uh, very, very, uh, you know, very biblical about it. Begin had his certainties. And one of his certainties was that the modern Amalek, the modern enemy of the Jewish people was Germany. And there is no compromise. Never let Amalek off the hook. Tim Chokin Zeche Amalek. We've got to like wipe out the memory of Amalek. Um, and he asked questions like in the Knesset, he said to Ben-Gurion, how much money are we getting for every dead Jew? So it's a very biblical way of asking questions. And he made fun of the German word for reparations, which was wieder gut machen, uh, which means make things good again. He says, how can you make things good again? They murdered my brother, they murdered my sister, they murdered my mother, they murdered my father. We should never accept money from Germany, it's blood money. And he was very emotional about it. And uh, there were uh, mass demonstrations in Israel, both for and against the more pragmatic side of Ben Gurion, which said, listen, our population just doubled in the first four years, went from 600,000 to 100 to 1 million 300,000, whilst fighting a war on all fronts. We need money wherever we can get it from. To Ben Gurion, to Begin, sorry, who was said, no, we need to stand on principles, not one cent. We don't want blood money. And there was riots outside the Knesset, windows were broken, uh, tear gas was used by riot police, ironically made in Germany. Uh, and basically, uh, from that moment onwards, Ben Gurion, by the way, got through with a narrow majority to accept reparations, as you all know, been to Israel and seen all the Mercedes taxis. Um, but from that moment on, Ben Gurion never referred to Begin by his name. He'd always say, the gentleman next to the member of Knesset, so and so. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. A lot of animosity and two very different worldviews: the pragmatic worldview of Ben Gurion and the very ideological, almost biblical worldview of uh, of Begin. So that's just one instance I wanted to highlight uh, from the early fifties. And then comes nineteen seventy-seven, and everybody is completely shocked by the election results. Nobody expected that. The the you know, everybody, the, the polls, they showed that uh, uh, Labour was going to, to win the elections again, um, but they didn't. Begin actually won. It was the, was it the ninth attempt? The ninth? Um... The ninth attempt after 29 years in opposition. I have to say, on a, uh, those who know me know that I'm particularly interested in languages, language and the uh, the then um, kind of he was nicknamed Mr. Television Chaim Yavin. He was Israel's definitive um, news presenter. He 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 got the results moments before uh, he had to to um, declare them to the nation, and he literally um, revived a Hebrew word. He didn't want to say that there was a mahapecha, which means a kind of revolution in Hebrew, because he thought that was too too strong perhaps for the nation to hear. He didn't want to use the word shinoi, which just means change because it was too weak. So he took the word mahapach, which kind of means reverse, but it wasn't a word that was used in Hebrew then. And that's how he started the news um, program that night. He said, hamahapach. And this word is known to this day as the day when Likud won uh, in 1977. And everything changed. Do you want to talk us, to us about that, Duvia? Yes, I mean, it was a real move. It was a real, real, um, hold on one second. I'm just going back to my screen here. It was, a, it was a moment in Israeli history, which no one saw coming. But on the other hand, it was kind of inevitable, especially after the Yom Kippur War. Uh, the Yom Kippur War, basically, the, the end of the Yom Kippur War, especially the Commission of Inquiry, the Argonne Commission of Inquiry afterwards, uh, combined with the corruption scandal of Yitzhak Rabin's wife, Leah, shock horror, having an American bank account. All these things together made people say, you know what, they've just been here for too long, the Labour government. They've been here for 30 years, and there's, they talk about peace. But we haven't actually made any peace with anyone else. And we saw uh, with the Yom Kippur War that they're not infallible. Uh, they, ha they have a lot of hubris, and maybe, just maybe, 
this expression in Hebrew, if we change the government, maybe the fortune or the future of the state of Israel will look slightly different. And uh, one of the main reasons why Begin did win that election was people who've been very much marginalized by the uh, elitist Ashkenazi Labour Party with the Mizrahi Jews or the Oriental Jews uh, who'd basically been looked down upon because, oh, you don't appreciate Mozart and you don't have a European education. Um, and those guys, those guys, the Mizrahi Jews, the voted in their droves for the Polish man with the suit. And you might wonder, you know, what, what was it about Begin that really, um, really attracted them? And basically he, he, was a, he was someone of the people. He was a man of the people. He didn't look at people by their ethnic background. He, he had a very Jewish way of looking at the Jews. Um, and he, he, the North African Jews, saw this Polish gentleman with a suit, A, that he came to visit them with a suit on, where the uh, Labour government had come to visit with that famous open white shirt. They said, well, he's giving us respect. Look how he dresses. And they realized that he understood the importance of peoplehood. And um, he gave a famous speech, which we're going to hear an excerpt of, um, uh, just before the se his second election, where he refers to, Yael mentioned she likes the Hebrew words. There's a Hebrew word, chach chach which is, we don't hear too much these days, uh, but it was a kind of a derogatory Ashkenazi way of talking about uh, Oriental Jews. So Begin gets up in his suit and his Polish accents in Hebrew and gives a famous speech on the eve of the election that helped him win that second election as well. So on one hand is uh, the, the Mizrahi Jews thought that here's a man who, who respects and honors them, and therefore they voted for him in droves. And also the traditional Jews as well saw Begin as a... Uh, much more traditional Jews. They, they found that the Labour government was very anti-religion, where Daniel Gordas, who wrote this book over here, his original title for this book was going to be, um, was going to be um, Menachem Begin, Israel's Jewish Prime Minister. Uh, but that, that title was actually nixed. But he did things that no head of state had ever done before. For example, once, once the surprise result came out and, and the Yavin call, coined that new word, Mahafach, the first thing Begin did was he took out a kippah from his pocket. Now, I doubt any Labour government leaders had a kippah in their pocket. He took out a kippah from his pocket, put it onto his head, and said the Hebrew prayer, Sheikh Yanu, thanking God for uh, keeping him alive to see this moment. A man deeply rooted in tradition. The second thing he did in that live TV announcement was he blessed his wife with a quote from the book of Jeremiah. His wife was always by his side. A beautiful story. And his first act as prime minister in 1977, which just shows how different he was his way of thinking than all the previous Labour governments was, as many of you might remember, after the Vietnam War, there was this tragic situation, the Vietnamese boat people floating the oceans of the world with nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, no sanctuary, no refuge. Menachem Begin's first act as prime minister was to admit Vietnamese boat people to Israel and give them Israeli citizenship. Now, this is a very, very biblical thing to do. As we all know in the Bible, when it talks about Jews, it says, you were slaves in Egypt. That's how the Haggadah begins. He says, just as we were slaves and treated badly, we are also going to make sure that we are show peace and justice to other people in the world. And um, it's not unusual today walking around Tel Aviv to see people looking very Asian, speaking fluent Hebrew, or descendants of these Vietnamese boat people who he enlisted. So people felt there was a new wind coming into uh, Israel. And of course, what he did the next year really proved the point. So maybe we can talk about what happened afterwards. I mean, obviously, his his main achievement would be the peace with Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, a very controversial thing that he did was to bomb the uh, to bomb the Iraqi um, nuclear plant. So okay. let's Let's talk about the peace with Egypt. Nobody before him, uh, not from the more, you know, peace league, perhaps Labour Party managed what Begin actually managed. How, how did that happen? Okay, so before we go into peace with Egypt, I just remembered in my mind, because uh, we'd ready, pre we have, just like Blue Peter, we have stuff we prepared earlier in the oven. So we have some video clips we prepared earlier. And we actually happen to have one of the famous speech he made when he wanted to unite 
uh, the Ashkenazi and the Sephardic Jews. And this speech, if anyone's been to the Menachem Begin Center in Jerusalem, which I well recommend, uh, it's a phenomenal place to visit. They have recordings of his speeches. And one of the most famous speeches he gave was when he says, we are all, we don't need to focus on what divides us, but what we have in common. So before we move on to the peace with Egypt, I'd like to ask Steve to show us the, the third clip, uh, which talks about his warmth and, and uh, treatment of uh, Oriental Jews. And it finishes with that famous clip when he references the two Jews who blew themselves up in the cell near Gun, one was Ashkenazi, one was Sephardi. And then his last four words, there are English subtitles, tells you exactly the way he felt about Jewish peoplehood. So let's have a look at that clip before we move on to the uh, peace with Egypt. Steve. No, not that one. Okay, we'll do that one. Okay, pause. Okay, this one. Yeah, we can watch this one as well if you want to hear Begin instead of hearing ours. This is the way Begin relates to the German Chancellor. As we mentioned, he had one very, very uh, clear principle in his life, that Germany was the enemy of the Jewish people, and he couldn't get that out of his head because of what had happened to him personally. So here's a famous clip of Begin. Well, watch that clip, Steve, which is basically Begin uh, reacting to the German chancellor telling him how to run the country. Okay, go for it. Okay, so whether you like him or don't like him, he was definitely a very colorful speaker. Now let's go on to the next clip, Steve, which is the way that he, uh, the way his relationship with the Eastern, with Mizrahi Jews, which is a very warm relationship. Let's go on to that one, the next this clip. Is, um, the riffraff speech. Yes, the riffraff speech, yes. Okay. And here's a very different begging. המפלגה <laughs> Are we Tobia? The subtitles there, you have to make it a bit smaller so we can see the subtitles. You got it? No, there don't seem to be any subtitles. It doesn't it doesn't matter. I think the main thing is is the, the bit that we saw was the main thing. Let's just, just go skip right to the end when he gives the speech. The very, very last, like, 20 seconds. Yeah, this here. Ashkenazi, Iraqi, Yehudi, Achim, 
Okay, that's enough. So basically, yeah, so when he finishes off his speech, he says, it doesn't matter if you're Ashkenazi or Sephardi, we're Jews, we're brothers, we're fighters, we're all one thing together. So basically, he has this very charismatic way of talking, expressing himself, very biblical terms, right? He also uses, as Yahweh will be able to tell you, like an old type of Hebrew as well. We call it Ivrit Shel It's very good Hebrew uh, and a lot of biblical allusions, which explains uh, what you mentioned earlier, which is very interesting. So you think, well, here's a hard, here's a very right wing person. Uh, you heard what he said about the Palestinian state, we we'll never do a Palestinian state, we're all one together, the Jews are the most important thing, and yet within a year of office he does what 30 years of Labour government did not do, makes peace with number one enemy of, of Israel, Egypt. The irony is just is, is, is incredible. When for 30 years, the left of center parties Israel talked about peace all the time, but it couldn't do anything. Within a year of office, Anwar Sadat is landing in Israel and addressing the Knesset in Jerusalem. And you need to ask yourselves, what was it about Begin that could enable this to happen so quickly? I remember as a child watching Sadat land in uh, Israel, something we could have never thought possible. Who would have thought that the, that the head of the state of Egypt, that just four years earlier been trying to wipe out the Jewish state in the Yom Kippur War, and tried to wipe out the Jewish state in 1948, the largest Arab country, the head of that state would be addressing the Knesset in Jerusalem, and peace would be carried out with uh, Egypt and Israel, which as we know, opened up uh, a whole Pandora's box of peace treaties, followed by Jordan, followed recently by the Abraham Accords, all that started with Egypt, and without Egypt, none of that would have been possible. Tovi, I'm, I'm aware that we, we want to, to allocate a little bit of uh, time for some questions, so maybe it's not going to do it any justice, but maybe in literally a minute or two, you can say something about the dramatic downturn of, of Begin. Okay, so when Begin was in power, he had something called the Begin Doctrine, which was never again, means never again, the state of Israel is ever threatened, Jews are ever threatened, as long as he's in power, uh, that's not going to happen. That's why he ordered the bombing of the Iraqi nuclear reactor in 1981. Uh, and that's why in 1982, when Israel came under intense artillery fire from the PLO in Lebanon, and the Israeli ambassador in London, Shlomo Agav, was shot and critically wounded, uh, Begin said, enough is enough. Never again means never again. We have a Jewish state. And he basically uh, okayed the Israeli army, the IDF, going into South Lebanon to clean up the uh, PLO bases. What happened next is what led to his downfall. All of Israel's wars until the First Lebanon War had been very popular wars amongst Israelis because they were all seen as wars of survival, wars of necessity. Milchemet Kiyum. Without without the war, there wouldn't be a Jewish state. Without the forty-eight war, the sixty-seven war, the seventy-three war, they were all accepted across the spectrum. And initially, when Israel went into Lebanon back in nineteen eighty-two, uh, it was understood why Israel went in. Just the same reason that Israel reacts to missile fire from a from the Hamas terrorists in Gaza, because no sovereign state will ex should or would accept its own citizens being under constant missile barrage. The problem is once they were in, the initial plan was to go into the Latini River, which is about 20 kilometers north of Lebanon, and clean up the PLO and come back. If that would have happened, then Begin might have stayed in power for many more years. The whole history of the Middle East might have been different. What happened next uh, was, was that the defense minister, Ariel Sharon, told the IDF to keep on going right into Beirut, and Lebanon became Israel's Vietnam, where the troops got bogged down in Lebanon um, and stayed basically in South Lebanon until the year 2000. I myself served in Lebanon. Uh, any uh, IDF combat soldier had tours of duty inside Lebanon. And anyone who tells you they weren't scared in Lebanon, they're either stupid or lying. It was a petrifying experience to be inside there, walking around with a loaded gun and uh, never knowing who's going to attack you. And many Israelis started asking, what are we doing there? And um, when Begin was in power uh, and they went over the Tini River and kept on going to Beirut and got bogged down, uh, protesters would stand outside the prime minister's office in Jerusalem, and every time an Israeli soldier was killed, they would add the number onto the list. And he just saw all these, these numbers growing and growing and growing, he had a deep love of the Jewish people. He was also, very, by that time, quite physically frail as well. He'd broken his leg, uh, he'd had a lot of uh, health issues, and both him and his wife were getting on in years. And uh, that combined with 
apparent lack of knowledge exactly what his defense minister was doing um, caused a lot of uncertainty in Israel. And also with Begin himself, he wasn't quite sure exactly what was uh, going on, so it seemed. And the straw that broke the camel's back, obviously, was uh, when he went on Washington, D.C. for mission. And when he went to speak uh, to the American president, on the way there, his wife, who was in hospital, given her, him her blessing, she passed away. And once his wife, Elisa, died, he just kind of lost the will to be there, to, to, to be in public anymore. And ironically, the man who spent 10 years of his life um, hiding from the British, spent the last 10 years of his life hiding from the Israelis and lived in total seclusion, was never seen in public except for twice a year to visit his wife's grave and to visit the doctors. And so really the Lebanon war and the death of his wife caused this fiery orator, this brilliant Zionist, this, this passionate man to spend the last 10 years of his life in total seclusion. Okay. Steve, we have just a few minutes. Do you want to to present questions to Tuvia from, from the chat or from a list that you already have? Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll just put some to, to Tuvia now. Um, Tuvia, can you, you, you referred earlier to um, revisionist Zionism. Can you, someone's mm. asking in the audience, can you please explain the meaning of that? Okay, so Jews, as we know, two Jews and three opinions, um, or as the Bible says, Shivim Panim and Torah, there's always different interpretations. So Zionism is not simple that we have Theodore Herzl who found a political Zionism. Within a few years, there's different breakaway forms of that Herzlian Zionism. One was called cultural Zionism by Echad Am. One was called labor Zionism. One of its big proponents was A.D. Gordon, which is a socialist uh, Zionism based on working the land. And uh, one was religious Zionism, where modern, what we call Mizrahi Jews, wanted to combine being religious and being Zionist. And their leader, of course, was Rabbi Koch. So they had these four forms of Zionism. If that wasn't enough, Along comes Zev Jabotinsky, 1880 to 1940, and he says, no, none of you guys have got it right. We need a different type of Zionism. We need to revise Zionism, that's the name of Visionist. Uh, and we don't want to take these compromises by the British and make our homeland smaller. We want a homeland on both sides of the Jordan River. And the only way to achieve this is by military struggle. So the uh, logo of the Ogun was taken from the... Um, uh, revisionist Zionism, which was very militant Zionism, but they literally had a hand clench holding a rifle uh, on top of both sides of the Jordan River, and two words in Hebrew, rak kach, only thus. We will only get a homeland if we don't rely on the pity of our host nations. We do need to stand up and fight for it, we need to fight for it with honor, and their concept was called hadav, honor. And that was basically very different from the socialist uh, philosophy, uh, the, or the Haganah, which was Aflaga, which was restrained. If we're attacked, then we will defend ourselves. The Agum was no, we're going to go out and attack the attackers before they attack us. It is much more militant. Okay. Um, thank you for, for that. Uh, someone else has, has asked here why, why did Begin resign? He was signed for two reasons. One is he literally, once his wife died, his, his spark just went out of him. They were so incredibly close. They were inseparable. The, once she died, he just basically lost the will to, to serve the public anymore and his own weaknesses. And also, the, the, he was a confused man by the end. He didn't quite understand what Ariel Sharon was doing. There was the Sabra and Shatila massacres in Lebanon. There was all sorts of things going on. And he wasn't clearly in the picture. And if you look at him in his, as his fiery orator days, you look at him at the end of his life, it's a total contrast of a human being. He was spent, he was a shattered human being. And he'd given everything for the country to such an extent that when he did resign, he didn't even have a flat to live in because the million dollars he got for winning the Nobel Peace Prize, he'd given to charity. He did everything he could for his country and his friends had to buy him a flat to spend the last 10 years of his life in seclusion. So he basically just lost the world to live and he was absolutely shattered by the casualty rate of the uh, Lebanon war. Interesting, okay. Um, uh, another question here. At one point, Begin asked Ben Gurion to return to office. Could you shed some some further light on that? 
Yeah, that was just before the Six Day War. If any of you were around, it looks like some of you were. I wasn't even a twinkle in the milkman's eye. But back in May 1967, people thought that there was going to be a third Holocaust. You know, it was really bad. You had all of Israel's enemies all on all the borders. The rhetoric coming out from Egypt and from Syria didn't leave much to the imagination. We're going to finish off Hitler's job. We're going to throw the Jews into the sea, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to be a momentous massacre. In Israel, there was panic. They were digging up graves in parks, mass graves. And in May 1967, there was a, a very much an, uh, a... a fear among the nation. And the prime minister at that time was Levi Eshkol, some of you might have heard about earlier, who wasn't known to be a charismatic dynamic speaker, especially in a dress he gave before the war when he started stuttering and stumbling because he couldn't read uh, his script properly. Um, and so Begin realized as much as him and Ben-Gurion had a tremendous animosity. Ben-Gurion was with one person who now is living in retirement, by the way, down in his kibbutz, that he united the nation this time. And he said, more than anything else, more than me, it's more important that the, the Israelis get united in this time of crisis. And he, he called on Ben-Gurion to, uh, to return to public office, which he didn't. But after that, Ben-Gurion said, if I would have known Begin better the way I know him now, maybe he wouldn't have had all that hatred. So that was it, just before the Six Day War. Pivotal moment. Um, another question here. What was the relationship between Begin and the Lachi Stern group? Yeah, well, people don't what people don't understand is just how small the Lechi or the Stern group was. I mentioned there was 30,000 fighters in the Haganah, 3,000 fighters near Gun, and the Lechi only had about 300 members at the top. And even and they broke away from the Agun. Even according to the standards of the of the Igun, these guys were like crazies. When uh, the Igun and Haganah decided when the war broke out in May, in uh, September 1939, they were going to have a ceasefire with the British. The Lehi not only said we're not having a ceasefire, we're going to carry on fighting the British. They also started secret negotiations with Mussolini's Italy, like they were like totally off the uh, off the spectrum. So there wasn't very warm relations at all. Everyone gets them to be outsiders. And then literally, there was just a couple of hundred of them. They just get a very uh, bloated perception because of how controversial they were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I think that's, that brings us to the, to the end of questions submitted here. But I understand, two of you, that you have um, some questions that were sent through to you. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> Let me find those ones. You can just talk quietly amongst yourselves whilst I just pull those up. Yeah, someone sent some questions in earlier, which I will just rustle up in one second. Meanwhile, Yael, what would you like to add about Ben Gurion, about about uh, Begin's legacy whilst I look up these questions? No, I, I I remember Begin. I remember actually a lot of comedians who 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 copied and imitated his his. Uh, the way he was talking, because what you have to remember is he was he was of a generation that was disappearing, and and the Hebrew that he used was very un it was amazing, but it was very un Sabra, un, un Israeli, not a new generation Hebrew. Um, so very much he was a man of his generation. Um, there'll be ne there'll never be Israel will never elect, I suppose, any leader who who is not a who doesn't represent current. Israel. So, so these guys, you know, Ben Gurion and Begin and Golda, whether you know whether you agreed or disagreed with them, they were all of them of a certain type and of a certain generation. Um, that anthropologically, it's fascinating to to view them leading the new country. Okay, so I that was very interesting. I just found the th the questions we have. So the questions I got sent in from. Uh, from Judith Ada in Bournemouth by the sea, is um, <clears throat> given the real the real regional destabilizing risks involved. What would Begin's approach be towards an increasingly belligerent nuclear armed Iran? I think we all know the answer to that because we saw what he did in 1981. In 1981, he he ordered uh, the Israeli Air Force, uh, whose the colonel in charge of planning was a young colonel by the name of Ilan Ramon, later to be Israel's first astronaut. He said, listen, Iraq is building a nuclear reactor. We need to stop it. 
And uh, that was his doctrine. His doctrine was if anyone rises up to threaten Israel, we're going to th- we're going to make we're going to take them out first. Because never again, it's not a statement. It has to be the reality. And so we saw what he did in 1981 against all the odds. Uh, nine Israeli planes flew 2,000 miles there and back and took out the Iraqi nuclear reactor. And of course, the whole world condemned Israel. Then 10 years later, when America invaded Iraq, they were very happy that Iraq did not have any nuclear potential. And he would do the same today. That's what the Begin Doctrine is, that weak Jews, uh, pale ghetto Jews running away from pogroms and the non-Jews, that's the that's out. We're now the new Jews and we will rise up and we'll defend ourselves with whatever means we have at our disposal. So I'm sure that's how he would uh, respond to that. Uh, the other question would be was what would his opinion be of Israel's outreach policies for peace with Arab states via the Abraham Accords? We know from what he did in Egypt that he was extremely, extremely for that. And I have a, um, a clip which we didn't manage to see about um, how he justified making peace with Egypt. You know, it was very controversial at the time, especially giving up so much land. Israel literally gave up a third of the land conquered in the Six Day War, including airfields, oil fields developed by Israel, an entire community called Yamit. And Begin's view on that was basically no more war and no more bloodshed. That's what he strived for. He's seen so much. Only someone who's been through war and bloodshed and, and murder and Holocaust would want to strive for peace so much. And uh, that's what he said when he got the Nobel Peace Prize in Sweden. He read from the uh, book of Isaiah, they will beat their swords into plowshares. So on the one hand, he was very much a proponent of peace with our neighbors. On the other hand, Oiva Voy, if anyone looked at Israel the wrong way, tried to threaten Israel. So again, a man of contradictions, but in his mind, it was all explained by the Bible. That you should always be strong, but at the same time, you should reach out your hand for peace. Um, and that's what we hear. Adonai Ozli Amor Yitain, Adonai Yivarechet Amor B'Shalom. God will bless his nation with strength, but also he should bless them with peace. And that was always the double-edged sword that Begin had. On the one hand, I have the olive branch, I'm prepared to reach out for peace. On the other hand, if you start with this, I also have a sword in the other hand as well, which as we all know is a symbol of the IDF, the sword wrapped with the olive branch. Fascinating. Um, just a question for me, and I do feel like I should know the answer and that possibly the answer might be very obvious, but where is um, Begin buried? That's an excellent, an excellent question. I even have a picture of it in our pictures. This is a great trivia question. Most people assume that all of Israel's leaders are buried on Mount Herzl. There's even a special section uh, called Chelkei Gedolei HaOmar where we, the people like Rabin are buried, Golda Meir is buried, Levi Eshkol is buried there, but not everyone, there's a few exceptions. One is uh, Ben Gurion himself, who's buried in the Negev next to his kibbutz and stable care. So he wanted people to come down and see how the Jews have made the Negev bloom. Uh, Israel's second prime minister, Moshe Sharet, believe it or not, is buried in Tel Aviv, which is the city that he loved the most. Uh, Ariel Sharon's buried on his farm. But the fourth prime minister who's not buried in Israel, uh, not buried in Israel, not buried on Mount Herzl, is Begin, who is buried on the Mount of Olives. Now, uh, my mother, who's on this uh, chat, and I actually saw his funeral uh, when he was being buried on the Mount of Olives, and there was literally hundreds of thousands of Jews from all backgrounds, religious, secular, Ashkenazi, Sfaudi, and they swarming to the Mount of Olives, and he left in his final um, um, will, he doesn't want any eulogies. And all it says on his grave is his name, his parents' name, and the year that he made Aliyah, which for him was his greatest achievement, the year that he, he moved to Israel. An incredible, humble man. And he also specified specifically where he wants to be buried on the Mount of Olives. And that was next to the graves of Moshe Arizani and uh, Mayor Feinstein, the two Igun members who blew themselves up with a grenade uh, in the cell, said, these are the heroes, these are the holy people. Because of them, we have a state of Israel, and I want to be buried next to them. So Menachem Begin, his wife, Eliza, are buried next to these two uh, young boys, the one Ashkenazi and one Sfaudi, on the Mount of Olives, with a very modest and simple uh, tombstone in a very traditional Jewish burial ground, which really sums up who, ben Go- uh, who Begin was. Uh, a traditional man, a modest man, and a man of deep uh, Jewish uh, beliefs. Okay, Tuvia, Yael, thank you. It's been a fascinating um, and insightful and immersive uh, presentation and experience. Um, To everyone who's joined us, thank you again on behalf of us, the Zionist Federation, and of the World Zionist Federation here in the UK. 
Um, like I said earlier, we have some exciting events coming up, but rather than bore you on here again, I'll send the recording of this evening's session tomorrow to you all, and I'll put details of all the events in there. Um, Tuvia, did you want to say any more about your event at Mill Hill next yeah, week? Yes, someone, someone asked on the chat, wait, doesn't he live in Israel? And the answer is <laughs> yes. But, uh, I'll be in, uh, I will be in uh, England just to check out the Hub of Empire uh, for six days. Uh, next Wednesday night at eight o'clock, uh, I'll be talking Mill Hill about a subject we spoke about on the Zionist Federation seminars right at the beginning, Ilan Maman. We started reading our Torah cycle recently with the Bereshit. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's so a very um, fittingly, we'll be honoring the uh, legacy and the life of Israel's first astronaut, Ilan Maman, and talking about specifically about the tour they took with him to space, about his life, and how he, how he as an individual encapsulated what it means to be a Zionist. Uh, and he went on a mission, which was very symbolic, a mission for the state of Israel, a mission for the Jewish people, and a mission also as a son and grandson of Holocaust survivors. So any of you would like at uh, eight o'clock next uh, Wednesday to the Mill Hill Synagogue. And one thing you'll notice that I actually have legs. Most of you probably just see me from the, the shoulders up on the square. But if you come to Mill Hill, you'll actually see the real life me. And he walks and he talks, yes. Um, uh, Tuvia, a lady in the audience this evening asked if um, will the event be be transmitted online as well simultaneously. That, I, I asked them that today. I don't yet have an answer, so I don't okay. know. Right. Maybe is the okay. answer. Maybe. Um, I will for everyone here who might be interested in that. I'll I'll include details of that in tomorrow's email as well. Um, so look out for them there. And um, Tuvia, please God, I'll see you there next Thursday. Wednesday. You're not going to see me on Thursday. You'll see me on Wednesday. Oh, by the way, the big the big news from Israel here. We should all know. Right, the big news from Israel is apparently in November finally Israel's going to open up for yes. vaccinated tourists. That's the big news now. So all of you who've been passionately yearning to to get back here, uh, it looks like it's going to be next month. Uh, and of course, I'll be happy to see you in person and show you around and off the beaten track and in our ancestors' footsteps and finally get people back home again where they belong. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay, Yael Tuvia, thank you very much to our audience. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, be well, and we'll see you, please God, soon online and in person. Thank you very much, everyone. Good night. Bye-bye.